Thank you to Elaine Cobb and the Family Access team for hosting this conference and to all of the attendees today. Uh, the title of my, I'm Carol Golly, and the title of my presentation is Pruning the Family Tree, the Plight of Grandparents Who Were Cut Off from Grandchildren. The topics for today's presentation are the following. I'll start with an introduction and definition of grandparent cutoff, and then talk about the significance and salience of the grandparent role. And then I'll do a brief review of the literature and research and what we know about the topic um, so far. And then I'm gonna talk about my dissertation research project from 2019 and just kind of talk about the significant findings from that. And then also uh, talk about interventions and coping for, for cut off grandparents. And then at the end, we'll have 15 minutes for question and answer period. So how do we describe grandparents? What are grandparent demographics currently in the United States? So there are 70 million grandparents in the US, which represents a third of the population in the country. And by age 65, 96% of Americans are grandparents. 1.7 million Americans become grandparents every year. And increased longevity has resulted in more children having grandparents because uh, gains in life expectancy have spent, uh, have resulted in grandparents spending many more years in the grandparent role now than ever before because life expectancy has tripled in the last 200 years. Uh, in 1900, fewer than 50% of adolescents in the US had two or more living grandparents. By 1980, this number, this number grew to 90%. In 2019, an AARP study found most grandparents have an average of four to five grandchildren. As a whole, grandparents are embracing multiculturalism, with a third having uh, grandchildren of a different race or ethnicity. Four in 10 grandparents were contributing to their strength as a significant market force. Why are grandparent grandchild relationships so important? What is general, general information regarding the relationships. The consensus of studies on grandparents and grandchildren show that they interact with each other often. They enjoy mutually satisfying relationships and, and are emotionally close. And why are grandchildren important to grandparents? 72% of grandparents report that being a grandparent is the single most important and satisfying thing in their lives. Grandparents agree that having grandchildren has a positive impact on their physical and emotional health. And grandparent relationships with grandchildren are of primary and significant importance and central to grandparent self-identity. So what about the grandchildren? Why are grandparents important to them? Grandparents serve as caregivers, mentors, playmates, storytellers, family historians, and friends. They transmit family values, ethnic heritage, spiritual and religious and family traditions. U.S. grandparents spent a total of $179 billion per year on their grandchildren, according to the AARP which is $2,562 per grandparent. One in 10 live in the same household as their grandchildren and babysit, and 5% of, of these grandparents provide their grandchildren's primary care. So 2.7 million United States grandparents are raising grandchildren.
Also, grandparents are a buffer between parent and children. Uh, I'm sorry, that would mean they're adult children. So um, between their parent, um, who is their adult child and their children. Also, grandparents can provide a consistent presence for grandchildren and help them negotiate development and life stresses. Grandparents provide listening and support to help support the adult parents and the child. They serve as valuable sources of social support for children during times of family stress. Children in divorce connected family emotional bonding with grandparents listening, keeping them safe and gift giving. And adolescents see their grandparents as important figures outside their immediate family and that grandparents are heavily active in their lives. As part of his work on family mediation, Krug from Canada determined it was important for the children of divorced parents to have an active relationship with their grandparents. He concluded that grandparents often play a vital role in helping grandchildren adjust to the consequences of parental divorce, providing a sanctuary for the emotional needs of their grandchildren at a time when parents faced with multiple losses and transitions in the divorce process are less emotionally available and responsive to their children. Also, it's found that grandparents play quite a significant role in, in adolescence. And I think this is interesting because I remember when my two children were adolescents and decided they really didn't want to talk to me a lot, but they did speak quite a bit to my, to my mom and my dad and um, had a, you know, kind of a, a lovely relationship with them. Um, even though I was kind of on the outside for a while, but I was, I was thankful for that. Uh, the majority of adolescents reported significant involvement of their closest grandparent in their lives and on high levels of emotional closeness. They perceived their grandparents as important persons in their lives and respected their grandparents' views. And interestingly, involved in stimulating grandparent interaction with infants is correlated with higher scores on measures of infant intelligence. There's a lot of benefits that grandparents provide for grandchildren. So uh, many alienated grandparents are familiar with Dr. Joshua Coleman, who is a well-known psychologist in private practice in San Francisco area and a leading authority on families, relationships, family estrangement and alienation. Um, his book, When Parents Hurt, offers compassionate strategies uh, when you and your adult child do not get along. And Dr. Coleman said, grandparents may have a greater investment in perpetuating the family lineage and therefore serve as a rich resource of identity, history, and stories of family members. I think this is something we all have either felt with our grandparents or, or we feel perhaps um, know this about our children's grandparents that they have really uh, performed a very important role. Uh, and then Edmund Burke, who was a, a philosopher and politician during the American Revolution uh, stated that, People will not look forward to posterity who never look backward to their ancestors. And so posterity means the future. So how can we, we see ourselves as a continuing line of, uh, of a family if, if we can't look back on that line and forward to how it will, it will carry on in the future. So, Okay, uh, influence of grandparents, uh, they provide emotional support for their adult children, the ch child's parents, which indirectly supports the grandchildren. And they model child rearing, sorry, child rearing skills, advice, and provide information. Uh, and I came across a study recently that said that uh, the 2019 AARP study, and it was saying, uh, 
how, uh, what percent of grandparents approve of the job that their grandchildren, that their adult children are doing with their grandchildren. Uh, and there was only about maybe a 40% to 50% approval rating, which I thought was interesting because uh, uh, it must be very hard for uh, grandparents to kind of, you know, offer advice about parenting, but you can see that they kind of like to from the results of that study, but they are modeling child rearing skills and maybe in the long run, that's more uh, productive than giving advice about parenting. Uh, children report that grandparents were the key people with whom the children talked immediately following a parental separation, and they were the most frequent source of intimate confiding about family problems. So given all that, uh, how do such vital and salient relationships go awry? It just seems counterintuitive. It doesn't make sense. Uh, it's hard to imagine how it could happen. However, instances exist in which grandparent-grandchild relationships are never established. Um, they're disrupted or cut off. But there's currently a minimal understanding of grandparent cutoff and little information or study of the phenomenon. So where did the term cutoff come from? I mean, we all kind of use it informally to refer to um, you know, relationships that just suddenly end. Um, but the, the, it was, the term was used by Mary Bowen, who was born in 1913. He was an American psychiatrist and a professor of psychiatry at Georgetown University. Uh, Bowen was among the pioneers of family therapy and a noted founder of Bowen Family Systems Therapy. So what he said was a, there a driving life force exists for personal autonomy on one hand and family togetherness on the other and uh, a differentiation of self occurs normally as an individual kind of negotiates those tasks and maintains a healthy sense of self separate from a parent. And such individuals um, are emotionally adaptive, have fewer physical, emotional, social, and marital problems than less differentiated individuals. So fusion is a term that is used for lack of personal differentiation and autonomy. Uh, and it refers to anxiety in the relationship. Unresolved emotional fusion it can be addressed through emotional distancing. Uh, and emotional cutoff occurs in more desperate efforts to geographically or physically cut oneself off from a parent or family of origin. Uh, and cutoff uh, is an unhealthy answer to fusion. fusion. It reflects the problem of underlying fusion and lack of differentiation. However, cutoff doesn't terminate an emotional process. It reflects, solves, but creates another problem in that it solves the anxiety in the moment by avoiding emotional contact, uh, but it creates a big problem by isolating and alienating people from one another who would otherwise benefit from contact and a chance to work through these kinds of issues. And Bowen said uh, that he found that, that these processes of, of uh, fusion and lack of differentiation and emotional cutoff seems to be uh, intergenerational and, and occur over several generations. He said when uh, differentiation and autonomy decrease, family generational lines progress towards an increased anxiety, fusion, and risk of cutoff. So um, that was the uh, underlying theory under my research and kind of helped me um, understand a little bit more about the term cutoff and some of the processes that occur in cutoff. Uh, so what are the basics we know from research and information about the phenomenon of grandparent cutoff? We know that 
Bonds are largely shaped by the relationship between the grandparent and their adult child. So the adult child becomes or is the gatekeeper to the grandchildren. Uh, Krug in 1995 found that grandparents lost access to children due to three life events. This was some of the early research on grandparent cutoff and, and Krug said that, uh, that the following three events uh, affected cutoff, parental separation or divorce, family feud, and a sudden event such as death of the adult child or relocation. And paternal grandparents are at highest risk of cutoff. And we'll talk a little bit more, a little bit more about that later. Uh, and transitions in the middle generation, like death, divorce, illness, or relocation, can compromise the ability, of course, of grandparents to engage with grandchildren. Uh, according to um, psychologists uh, Michael Bone and Glenn Caddy, uh, who are um, alienation experts. The phenomenon of cutoff really was uh, pretty rare until the 1940s, because at that time, three generations of families were living under one house and often in the same village. So um, with, other, with other relatives, but by uh, the 1980s, that was reduced to thir only 30% of household, households had three generations. So that's quite a drastic and and uh, in very fast shift uh, to uh, from intergenerational houses to more uh, nuclear family homes. Studies of grandparent cutoff identified serious effects on grandparents of being cut off. Grandparents had increased depressive symptoms compared to a non-contact loss group. Mental health progressively worsened for these grandparents as they grew older. The authors reported that cutoff grandparents experience intense chronic grief, symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, cognitive intrusion or thoughts kind of just coming into your head that you, you can't stop, uh, kind of painful thoughts, uh, numbness, shock and denial, shame, rejection, depression, and suggested a possible risk of suicide. Sudden contact loss resulted in a depressive spike, which returned to previous levels after three years, um, which we can talk a little bit more about later, but it's, uh, I noticed this in my research too, that people that had reported over three years of a, a contact loss uh, had reported less depression, less grief, and, uh, you know, there's wondering about that if perhaps emotional resiliency had kicked in and they were able to uh, to have less depression and grief as as time went on, which is hopeful. Um, other studies show a similar correlation between contact loss and increase in physical health problems, which is a real concern for seniors in our society that they're being affected physically by uh, by these issues. So how does cutoff happen? Uh, what are some pathways that could lead to grandparents being cut off? Uh, some pathways have been identified by researchers who surveyed effective grandparent, uh, affected grandparents. And they had found, uh, this was in um, about 1999, uh, the divorce of adult child could lead to cutoff, death of adult child, geographical separation, family feud, parental alienation, and dysfunctional grandparenting. Um, in, the, in 1999, the geographical separation was a pretty large factor, uh, yet more recent studies are finding that that's not the case, and the thinking is that it could be because of the internet and mobile phones and electronic communication between uh, grandparents and grandchildren that are able to stay in touch. So the geographical separation isn't, isn't so critical in, in being a pathway to cut off it, um, currently, apparently. So family feud was referred to by these kind of early researchers as ambivalent feelings and conflicts. 
uh, it, um, problem behavior and unstable family relationships described as family feud, uh, they noticed were consistent across four female generations. So there again, there's an intergenerational, um, uh, intergenerational uh, concept to the grandparent cutoff, which is very concerning. So um, looking in more detail, a divorce is one of the potential pathways to grandparent cutoff. Um, in the United States, about 50% of marriages end in divorce, which is the sixth highest divorce rate in the world. In 1995, 50% of non-custodial fathers in the UK, US, and Canada lost all contact with their children. Uh, and that's a pretty astounding factor. Of course, you know, this was, was 26 years ago. Um, the movement now more is to shared uh, parenting. But uh, so I, I don't know if this statistic would still hold, but nevertheless, it's very concerning. Divorce of adult children, a primary antecedent for grandparents, diminished accessibility to their grandchildren. Um, a lack of information exists on the effect of an adult child's divorce on grandparent grandchild relationships and other family systems. Although in general, all family relationships can be kind of put to the test uh, when parents divorce. A uh, second potential pathway to grandparent cutoff is parental alienation. Uh, parental alienation is defined as a mental condition in which a child usually seen in high conflict divorce aligns strongly with one favorite parent and rejects, rejects the other alienated parent without justification. Uh, this is from Dr. William Burnett in 2020, this definition, but it was first proposed by Richard Gardner in 1985 at uh, Columbia College. And there are eight manifestations of parental alienation in a child. Um, and, and one of them is a spread of animosity to the extended family of the alienated parents. So grandparents may become collateral damage as their adult child becomes alienated from his or her own child or children. I'll talk a little more about that later, but so parental alienation can be one, of, sadly, one of the pathways that not only a parent can be cut off, but the grandparents and extended family as well. Uh, I'll just talk a little bit about the five-factor model for diagnosing parental alienation, which is widely accepted in the parental alienation community. The child manifests resistance or refusal with one of the parents. And there's a presence of a prior positive relationship between the child and rejected parent. And sadly, we see that a lot with cut off grandparents that they had a very close relationship with their grandchildren before they were cut off. Uh, absence of abuse, neglect, or seriously deficient parenting to diagnose PA, PA and then use of alienating behaviors by the preferred parent. Uh, and then these are the eight behavioral manifestations in the child for parental alienation, which I think, um, you know, people at uh, the Family Access Conference this weekend are, you know, probably know a great deal about this. There, there's some wonderful uh, presenters that are talking in depth about this. But I was focusing on number eight, which is rejection of the alienated parents' extended family. But sadly, these other manifestations, you know, a campaign of denigration, uh, weak or frivolous rationalizations that don't make any sense of why the parent is cut off and rejected, uh, lack of all, lack of ambivalence, which you know the favored parent is all good and the alienated parent is all bad. These types of things can be leveled at grandparents too. So it's important um, if you are a cut off grandparent to. Uh, and you're affected by parental alienation, you become familiar with these. So you know what they are when you see them in, um, and, and you can learn about it and learn that it's, uh, these aren't true about you. They're um, sadly manifestations of alienation in the child. 
And I just thought I'd take a second to um, explain my interest in the area of grandparent cutoff. Uh, I worked as a clinician involved in high conflict divorce, um, court ordered cases with equine facility therapy. Uh, and I had a special interest and concern for the situation and how deleterious it is for families um, that experience estrangement and alienation. Uh, and then I was um, invited to become a founding board member of Alienated Grandparents Anonymous in 2013 in Naples, Florida, uh, which is a nonprofit. Um, and our Amanda is our uh, anonymous founder and director. Uh, and um, AGA provides support information, coping skills and strategies, hopefully for reunification, but also for coping. And currently we have 100 and, 150 support groups in 50 states and 22 countries, which I mean, it sounds good that we've grown that fast, but it's really very sad that it's had to grow that fast, that there, this is just a global epidemic. Um, and, um, uh, and, and that's very concerning. And we have an international board of experts who share knowledge as does Family Access Board. And, uh, provides a lot of support for grandparents. Um, we, we have documents we can share with for physicians, clergy, legal, and mental health providers to help them understand the phenomenon. Uh, and then communications with many thousands of grandparents who have been affected that we have learned uh, immensely from. So, um, oh, and this is some. Um, uh, our, our anonymous director, Amanda, wrote this uh, book called I Thought I Was the Only One, Grandparent Alienation, a Global Epidemic. Um, and it's a very comprehensive uh, guide to the phenomenon of grandparent cutoff. It shares a lot of experiences in their own words from the grandparents and also ideas about uh, family estrangement, alienation, and legal approaches. Uh, and you can really see the bravery in these in the grandparents as they uh, try lots of different things to connect and what has helped them cope and what has helped sometimes in reconnecting through this book. So at HEA um, in 2013, we, we wanted to learn more about the grandparents who were contacting AGA because this was really a new thing. And, uh, grandparent cutoff and we didn't really know much about it. So we came up with just some informal surveys uh, and we had 104 of them return with very long letters attached to most of them, which were quite lovely. And, uh, and so we had 62 of these grandparents reported being com completely cut off from the grandchildren. 88 reported trouble sleeping, 67 reported percent reported nightmares. 30% reported suicidal ideation, 92% reported depression, and 76% sought counseling to cope. So these are pretty astounding numbers. These do not reflect the general population uh, of these con uh, constructs among uh, seniors in our society at all. And of course, you, we could expect that the ones who sent and returned these questionnaires were um, very interested in in being involved in sharing their feelings and thoughts. Um, so I'm sure that's part of why the numbers are so high, but it's still incredibly um, concerning. So I use this information uh, to form the basis for some of the questions I wanted to ask in my doctoral research and after I had some input from some of the experts in the field. Uh, and 377 grandparents completed my doctoral survey. Um, this is the breakdown of their um, demographics, 88% female, uh, age 41 to 90, 90% 90 white, 0.8 black, 1.3 Native American. I wish we had been more ethnically diverse, but that's um, would be a super, uh, our next goal. So primarily North America, um, at least an 88 degrees, 60%, and 60% married and 27% divorced. And these were the measures I used to assess for the constructs I wanted to learn about, which was um, 
depression, suicidal behaviors, complicated grief and self-reported health. Uh, co complex grief is characterized by symptoms of separation distress and traumatic distress. And self-reported health was represented by two questions that ask grandparents about their physical health, those prior and those cut off. Okay, so out of the 377, I, we had, I had 274 that reported no contact at all with their grandchildren. And 46% reported moderate to severe levels of depression. And 29% met criteria for respondents at risk for suicidal behaviors. So according to the CDC, these are not normal. Um, for older adults, uh, depression among seniors in uh, age 65 and over in the United States ranges from 1% to 2%, not 46%. Uh, suicidal behaviors, we had the 29% indicating, but the norm for seniors in the United States is to only 2 to 3%. So these, this is very concerning. 13, almost 13% met uh, criteria for complicated grief. The prevalence of complicated grief within the general population is only about 4%. So again, this was high. Uh, complicated grief is a particularly debilitating type of grief. Uh, these symptoms are analogous to post-traumatic stress uh, of, of persistent yearning for the lost objects, separation, distress, shock, emotional numbing, sense of being alone in the world, life is meaningless, and post-traumatic stress disorder, which is re-experiencing thoughts of the loss and, and having nightmares. Um, and grandparents in general reported feeling these symptoms for more than six months. So a researcher who studied complicated grief summed it up as Living with someone who is both here and gone, or gone and not for sure, is a bizarre human experience that produces confusion, doubt, and anxiety. It's just not a normal human experience. A complicated grief can result from ambiguous loss, such as a grandchild who is not physically present, but is present in the heart and mind of the grandparent. Continued hope for reunification, sense of powerlessness, role confusion, am I still a grandparent? Am, what, who am I now? Uh, and social support and ambiguous loss tends to disappear over time. It's such a hard thing to cope with, but people fall away if, um, you know, if. If they, I mean, sadly, over time, people in social support follow away, uh, fall away from, from people that have years of these kinds of issues. Not always, but um, that can be debilitating because the last thing this person's needed is more isolation. But one parent described it, one grandparent described it as, Everywhere I went, I looked. Although years had gone by, the, the grandfather said, everywhere I, every time I went out, I would always look, you never stop looking because you don't really know what they look like, but you're hoping you'll recognize them. And, and that's the end, kind of a description of ambiguous loss. It makes it hard to move on and regain mastery in life. Uh, the percentage, oh, this is the self-reported health. This is really concerning. The percentage of grandparents who reported being in good health currently was nearly half of that of those who reported good health prior to being cut off. Uh, of course, we don't, you know, we don't, I mean, self-reported health is considered a valid measure of somebody's health uh, in the research, but, um, you know, we don't have measurements and things like that. But but the fact that it had the, the cutoff was associated um, to them with, with, with experiencing far poorer 
health outcomes is, is very concerning. So I also asked respondents, who did they see was most responsible for the cutoff? Almost three quarters found daughter or daughter-in-law most responsible, which is reflective of the literature. Uh, son-in-law, 15% and son, 13%. Other researchers investigating grandparent involvement after a divorce in the middle generation found that grandchild relationships with maternal grandparents were often strengthened because mothers received primary custody or the majority of custody, whereas the paternal grandparents' relationship with their grandchildren was often weakened. So uh, other potential pathways to cut off uh, were asked uh, and uh, nearly, well, 43% indicated they were cut off when their adult child was cut off through alienation. In other words, the grandparent was cut off along with their adult child when the adult child was actively alienated from their children by a current or former partner or spouse. The grandparent becomes what is called collateral damage and uh, as their adult child is, uh, is cut off and alienated. Uh, almost a third be reported being cut off when their adult child died. Um, one quote from that, from a grandparent is, not only did I lose my son, but both of my grandparent, grandchildren also. My daughter-in-law cut ties, moved away, and has refused to let us see or talk to our grandchildren for nine years. And I know of a grandparent whose uh, son was in the Royal uh, Air Force in England, and he died. Uh, and at the time, the son and the daughter-in-law and the granddaughter were living with the grandmother. But after the son died, uh, the daughter moved out and, and just never looked back and, and cut the grandmother out of their life. Until years later, when she was able to use the courts in England to gain access to her adolescent granddaughter and rebuild ties. But another way, um, uh, a third set lost contact when their adult child divorced. A fourth set of grandparents reported being cut off from their grandchildren when they divorced or broke up with their adult child's other parent. Typically, these would be older adult children who chose sides when their parents divorce later in life and reject one over the other. Um, the final category of grandparents typically report having a normal relationship with their child who grew up, got married, uh, and was then unjustly influenced to reject, reject the grandparents and limit or cut off access to them. And one of the articles on this said, the risk comes once the spouse enters the picture. You just never know how that's gonna profoundly change your family and everybody hopes for the best, but it doesn't always turn out that way, sadly especially when you consider that about 14% of our population has a personality disorder and how that affects marriages and families and relationships is it's just very difficult um, for families to cope um, with someone who has a, a severe personality disorder. It brings many challenges, not always, but okay. So, and, uh, this is important for, I think, mental health professionals because counseling was sought by 72% of grandparents in, in the, my dissertation study. And I was curious, is that helping them? Uh, so 40% found counselors somewhat effective and 22% not so effective in helping them manage their feelings about the cutoff. So I'm not sure um, if it's, you know, why that is. I'd like to find out more about that. Is it because, uh, you know, that maybe the grandparents were really helping the counselor could could help them with reunification, which is uh, maybe, you know, didn't happen, or is it because the counselor didn't really know much about grandparent cutoff? 31% found the counselor somewhat knowledgeable, 
and 20% not so knowledgeable and 19% not knowledgeable at all about cutoff. And I think we find this in the parental alienation world also that there's, um, there's no uh, training in graduate schools, at least of social work I know regarding um, parental alienation and grandparent cutoff. And I think there's a lot of mental health uh, providers that had just not been exposed to it and haven't read about it. So it can really make things worse because they can blame the grandparent and say, well, or the alienated parents said, well, you must have really, you know, done something wrong for this to happen. But really it's because they do not understand the dynamics. And of course we know there's bad grandparents, um, but, um, you know, in, in so many of these cases, it has nothing to do with anything the grandparent ever did. So 42% uh, um, found attending a, sport, a support group somewhat helpful. And 36 found this very or extremely helpful. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. So uh, parental alienation pathway to grandparent cutoff. Uh, this is a widely uh, accepted as being emotional abuse of children to be alienated from a parent or cut off from a grandparent. And emotional abuse is a repeated pattern of caregiver behavior or extreme incidents that convey to children that they are worthless, flawed, unloved, unwanted, endangered, or only a value in meeting another needs. That's really what happens in, uh, it, you know, with an alienated child because they're told the other parent doesn't love them. And who knows what grandparents are told? Oh, maybe they're the adult child is telling them that the grandparent doesn't love them, you know, some of these similar type things. So that is an example of emotional abuse. Uh, other examples are uh, rejecting, ignoring, isolating, corrupting, exploiting, terrorizing, verbally assaulting, and overpressuring. So in some cases, uh, you know, their children are threatened with abandonment. Oh, if you're going to go see your grandparents, don't bother to come home. Or, uh, you know, if you're going to see your father, then go, you're going to have to go live with him. So, um, you know, they're threatening, threatened with abandonment and, and loss of love. And that is uh, emotional abuse. So parental alienation, it, in my opinion, is a social justice issue, uh, which means that uh, it's it, it's it's uh, discriminating against a, a large population of our society, the, and society needs to be very concerned about this because of the de deleterious effects on the parents, the children, and the grandparents. Uh, according to Dr. Burnett, there is not only a large body of research validating the existence and harms of parental alienation, um, with over 500 articles on the subject. Uh, but it represents 10.5 million parents in the United States. The sheer magnitude of parental alienation indicates that this is a major social problem and a social justice issue for children and families. Uh, there's a, a startling rate of 13.4% of parents reporting that they have been alienated from one or more of their children by the other parent with half of those reporting alienation as severe. This was from a sample of representative, a poll of adults in the United States, 13.4%. I mean, that's, wow, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's very concerning. So if we're gonna find out what long-term effects of cutoff are on grandparents, we don't really have, um, I mean, on grandchildren, on grandchildren, we don't really have research on that. Uh, yet. So we can look to the long-term impact of PAS on, on children. So the first study that I ever saw about that was Dr. Amy Baker's 2007 uh, case studies of severely alienated children interviewed as adults. This is the first time really I had heard about parental alienation and reading this book was a real eye-opener because these were adult children who came to realization that they were alienated and 40 participants. And then 
Dr. Baker surveyed them and interviewed them to see how they were functioning, how they thought the alienated, alienation affected them as adults. And this is what they reported, low self-esteem, 65%, depression, 70%, drug and alcohol use, 35%, lack of trust, and alienation from their own children. Again, there's that intergenerational nature that keeps popping up to, the, to this uh, phenomenon. And then 57% of her um, subjects reported uh, being divorced themselves, which is higher than the national rate. Uh, and these outcomes are consistent with previous research on the negative effects of intergenerational alliances, family triangulation, and family system disruptions. So, so uh, what, what would we expect to see? What would attachment theory tell us about possible effects of uh, uh, grandparent cutoff on the grandchildren? because I don't know of any research on this, but we can kind of look to what we know about attachment theory. So babies form multiple attachment relationships arranged hierarchically. So it would be, you know, primary caregiver, um, you know, the mom and dad could be the grandparents or um, primary caregivers, or, um, you know, certainly extremely important to attachment also. As the baby grows, he or she develop, develops multiple attachment bonds with others whom the child can turn to for support and comfort over the lifespan. Um, this was said by Mary Ainsworth, who was one of um, Dr. Will, William, William Bowlby, Dr. Bowlby. He was the original attachment uh, researcher and Mary Ainsworth kept up his work and did a lot of work in Ghana and found that, you know, there's this, um, global um, process of attachment that goes on with every child in every culture. So believing that one is unloved by a caregiver becomes a belief that one is truly deeply unlovable. Uh, in parental alienation syndrome, children are told they are unloved by the other parent and that parent's extended family. As alienated children suffer the loss of primary attachment figures, such as grandparents, they may also lose the feeling of, of being worthy of love. Similarly, as if they had um, an attachment disruption with a parent. And this, you know, these attachment bonds have been identified by attachment research as being profoundly critical in, uh, in utero in the first year or three of life. A year or three of life. And uh, they, they neurobiologically are, are very critical and they help with brain development. And uh, there are certain areas of the brain that don't develop well without healthy attachment. Um, it includes self-regulation, memory. Um, and so we can extrapolate that, that being cut off from primary relationships is profoundly damaging. Okay, grandparent, we can also think of a grandparent um, cut off as abuse, um, not only from the um, effects of attachment disruption, um, but parental um, children are deprived and cut off from protective and vital relationships. Disruption in primary attachment relationships changes the brain. Um, there is a, a, a researcher called um, a psychiatrist, Dr. Bruce Perry in Texas, who has done a lot of research on how disrupt, uh, attachment disruption affects neurobiology. There are quite a few wonderful researchers working on that, but um, Bruce Perry wrote a, uh, a book called The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog that is his case studies from his practice about children that suffered neglect and, and attachment disruption and how that affected his brain. And, um, it's a very interesting book, and it also explains a lot of the science behind it, but it's just a very, you can't put, put it down because it's, you're hoping so much for these children that have been through great trials. Um, uh, so um, Bruce Perry is one of the most prolific researchers in this area. But it's critical because 
uh, attachment relationships are thought to fuel all future emotional and physical health. So, so children are learning life lessons that to value family. Um, I think the long long term effects of these uh, estrangements are generally harmful for grandchildren. Oh, I'm sorry, I inadvertently skipped a slide. Okay. Um, grandchildren who witness their grandparents treated with contempt by their parents may be learning life lessons about a family culture that devalues salient extended family relationships. And there's a uh, kind of a classic book written by uh, a man named Litz. He was a psychiatrist and professor at Johns Hopkins, Theodore Litz, uh, Johns Hopkins in Yale. His textbook, The Person, has been widely used in courses on personality development, schools of medicine, nursing, and social work. But in his classic text, he has this line that I've, I've kind of noticed over the years. And it says, how the old people are treated by their children commonly furnishes an illustration to grandchildren of how persons treat persons. So the modeling that's done by uh, the treatment of how we treat other people, how we treat our, our families, how we treat our elders. Uh, that's, that's really um, critical to how children develop their worldview. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very sad if children are not getting the proper um, modeling for that. So, um, so I think that's a really important quote. So Josh, uh, Dr. Coleman talks about effects of estrangement on grandchildren. And he um, has some wise thoughts about this. He said, I think the long-term effects of these estrangements are generally harmful for grandchildren, especially those who were once very attached to the grandparents. They learn that attachments are temporary and that families that were once loving and close can quickly become distant and angry. They're also presented with the model that estrangement is a reasonable way to manage family conflict. Kind of like with Bowen's work on, well, you're a little anxious, things aren't, um, and you're having trouble individuating from your parent, maybe there's some anxiety, and let's just move to um, manage this by estrangement and cutoff. The grandchildren are denied a potentially loving and positive influence in their lives. I'm hopeful that as there will be a greater awareness of the impact of estrangement and alienation, that less families have to be faced with it in future generations. It's also very concerning because the health effects on grandparents um, Amanda from AGA says, quote, grandparent alienation is invisible because no one sees the anxiety or broken heart. So it can be thought of as being the invisible abuse, but stress-related illnesses cause serious issues like migraines, high blood pressure, gastrointestinal problems, sleep disorder, a lot of grandparents report having difficulty sleeping, which that makes you know everything uh, worse and harder and more serious. Obesity, TMJ, which is teeth grinding, acute anxiety, PTSD, and depression. Also, elder abuse can lead to increased risk risk of nursing home placement, use of emergency services, hospitalization, and death. So. We could think of grandparent cutoff as a public health crisis. Uh, the CDC goals are to keep America secure by controlling disease outbreaks, making sure food and water are safe, helping people avoid leading causes of death, such as heart disease, cancer, stroke, and diabetes, and work, working globally to reduce threats to the nation's health. Uh, 
The Center for Disease Control and Prevention is the leading health agency in the United States. They're dedicated to saving lives and protecting the health of grandparents. A goal would be to educate and advocate for grandparents cut off from grandchildren with public health agencies and call for policy and actions to protect this vulnerable, vulnerable and seemingly increasing population. The World Health Organization policy objectives are maximizing the potential for each person's health throughout their lives to achieve adequate standards of quality of life, uh, increasing chances of survival at birth and an increase an increase in active life expectancy, ensuring the quality of life and reduction of differences relating to the health of all social groups. So clearly we can see that uh, there is a global issue and it seems as though the public health agencies in the United States and the world would be concerned with the effects of grandparent um, cut off. Uh, Amanda also says, we must reach out to enlist the help of physicians in identifying the symptoms of alienation as a possible underlying cause of illness in the adult population. And a lot of times, you know, grandparents have said, well, I, I don't really tell a lot of people about it because I'm ashamed, I'm embarrassed. You know, I have lived in Florida for 35 years and that's the state of the grand, you know, grandparents state. And everybody talks about their grandparent and it's very, very painful for people to, a lot of grandparents to say, I, I'm not allowed to see my grandchildren or I don't see them. And sometimes they won't tell their medical provider and, um, so our awareness and, and, and talking about this um, will hopefully help to change, change that. But uh, if we do have a, um, an AGA letter to physicians that explains about grandparent cutoff so that they can become educated on it and, and, and be aware of it and, and maybe query their patients about it. So what are potential strategies for grandparents if, if they're cut off. Um, uh, again, I'm quoting Amanda, she, she just is a wealth of knowledge and I, I've um, been studying the lovely book she wrote. Amanda says, if reunification with grandchildren is your goal, then remember that grandparent alienation is not about fairness. It's about doing what might work. The best reason to reach out yet again is that it just might work this time. So think as a proactive person, not a victim. Don't let fear guide you. Edmund Burke, the Irish state, statesman I, I quoted earlier, he's got so many wonderful quotes, um, but he says the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men or women to do nothing. And so we want to have you know, grandparents want to have action and, and not, not allow the fear to take over. Uh, be a positive role model for doing the right thing. Move toward action. Recognize your grandchildren's birthdays and special occasions. Remember, your, your grandchildren want you in their lives. It's not normal for a grandchild not to want a grandparent in their lives. It's just not. And, um, and they want you in their lives. And so see if you can hold that, hold that in your heart and remember that and, and despite great um, difficulty and being sometimes treated poorly, very poorly, to keep that in your heart. Face challenges with confidence, you are still the parent. These problems can be opportunities for growth. Realize that it will be difficult because you're opening up yourself up to be rejected again but you're working on a resolution. Hold that picture in your mind and visualize the future. We can look at what's worked for um, strategies for grandparents in alienation. Um, and uh, Baker and Fine in 2014 noted that targeted parents in PA situations use the following strategies in obtaining reunification. They became educated and informed. 
They never gave up. They saw the alienation from the child's perspective. They respected the child's pace and they didn't expect an apology. And some of these things are really hard to do. You want to push hard. You want to say, hey, you know, you really hurt me. I, you know, did you realize what you did, what you've done to me? And, um, and that kind of thing. But it takes kind of a very specialized approach. Uh, there are some wonderful videos on the Family Access website. Um, Dr. Baker has one on reaching out to an adult child and how to do that and never give up and the right emotional um, approach, I mean, not emotional, behavioral approach to take, well, and emotional. So, um, and a dozen or more, oh, and she has another one on um, writing an amends letter, which I'll talk about in a minute. But those, um, the Family Access website is just a wealth of knowledge with all the experts that have shared videos and articles and, um, and, and have suggestions on things that have worked in the past that can help. It may, you know, may work. At AGA, we've had 300 reunifications known to us since 2013. And uh, grandparents saying using those strategies really helped. So never give up. Um, focus more potential strategies. Don't give up, communicate. Focus on your adult child because they're the gatekeeper uh, and keep reaching out. You, you don't know if they're reading the text letters and emails. However, many cases of reunification where the child or adult child, um, where they said, I never responded, but I actually read every single one. Uh, model being safe and loving. And, and it's important not to act needy, you know, emotionally hurt and needy because uh, these kids feel, report feeling extremely guilty about this, you know, awful things they've said and done. And uh, they, they, to avoid having to deal with the guilt, um, they, they don't want to, they don't want to know that you're going to talk about how hurt you are or the bad things you've done. I mean, that they've done. So uh, it's better not to uh, show, you know, not to let them know that you're, you're really hurting, but go to other support areas for, the, for those needs. Um, an example of the kind of, um, oh, I'm sorry, let me finish this first. And you wanna cycle through themes. I love you. I would love to work things out, but keep it light. Nurture empathy for your adult child. Share a brief, fun, and meaningful memory. Um, and enhance critical thinking skills for your adult child through reflection instead of reaction. Because that's one thing that's really missing with alienated kids and, um, you know, uh, the kind of the black and white all or nothing thinking that happens in alienation. There's no critical thinking skills. There's no, um, uh, you know, every, everything that you do is bad or wrong. So you want to encourage them to have critical thinking by just exploring with them. Well, I wonder if you ever thought about um, this, or I wonder what it was like for you to think that, uh, you know, I wasn't at your school play, you know, to kind of wonder those kinds of things rather than be defensive and, says, I, and say, I sure was there. You know, so um, Dr. Baker gives a lot of great examples of that on, uh, the Family Access website and in some of her articles too. Um, but an example might be uh, if you wanted to share a brief text or email with your adult child saying something like, hi, honey, I drove by the park today. And remember the time when you were about four and you made a mud fort in the rain um, with your friend Jimmy and, and then, and it took me, you know, three hours to get you clean and we laugh so hard. I mean, something funny like that, you just never know what's gonna stir a memory, uh, something fun in the past. Um, would love to meet for coffee sometime, lots of love to you, to you all, mom. Something like that, you know, something kind of uh, light and, uh, um, but letting them know that you love them and you're thinking of them. Uh, let's see, or even saying, um, you, if you haven't heard back from them in a while, you must be really angry at me. 
um, it must be hard for you to, uh, you know, to think that I didn't love you or didn't do this or that. And that, that's the critical thinking again. Another idea uh, for grandchildren that you haven't been allowed to see is to build a memory box, uh, build a history for them. Oops, I'm sorry, I'll just. Um, so a memory box is maybe birthday cards and Christmas presents, gifts, letters you wrote to them, uh, uh, tell them about you, attach your story, photos, cards, and gifts you never, you never get to send. Uh, because they may come back someday, hopefully they will for reunification and they'll say, Grandma, why didn't you ever write me? You know, my, I never got any letters and cards and you say, well, I, I always wrote you and I've got them right here. Um, you could cons uh, consider, you could share life lessons and how much you love them. Um, you could attach a book that was written by Reverend John Killinger, um, who is a uh, on the, um, I know, advisory board of uh, AGA and also has presented at Family Access. And he is a former pastor um, and taught for 15 years at Vanderbilt Divinity School and Harvard and University of Kentucky. He's the author of over 70 books. And three of them are from Poppy Would Love, Letters from a Grandfather to the Grandchildren. He wasn't allowed to see. And he tells beautiful stories about things that he did. Um, each one is a page or two uh, and things that he, and he's thinking of his grandchild or, you know, he's out um, in the taking a walk in the field or walking his dog and just sharing stories about things that he wished he, he got to share with his grandchildren over the years. But, um, you know, attach a book, you could include one of his lovely books that might make your grandchild realize, yeah, my, my granddad really did miss out on me. Um, okay. Uh, also, um, writing an amends letter to a child is uh, in a very specific way, because that can be kind of tricky and get us into the weeds a little, because again, we don't want to be blaming or needy. Um, and there's uh, some uh, guidance with that through Dr. Baker's videos, also in, uh, in Amanda's book, also in Dr. Richard Warshock's book, Divorce Poison, I think. I know that Dr. Warshock's written quite a bit on making amends letters to um, the uh, alienated child. It's not that you're saying you were right, I'm bad. It's just how to form a relationship again. So that there are some specific ideas on how to do that. Uh, okay, interventions coping for cut off grandparents, reunification. Um, we, uh, in my survey, a total of 101 grandparents reported that they were, although they were cut off, there was some degree of contact restored. But they reported uh, the level of satisfaction with the current level of contact was was quite poor, and for for about 30% um, of them, so they weren't totally trusting that they weren't going to be cut off again, and that was very difficult. Uh, we've had, a, you know, other situations where uh, the reunification has really picked up where where the relationship left off, and and they haven't had those, you know, worries about trust. So, um, but I, it it can be, um, although hoped for, it can be tricky, and you, uh, you know, are uh, you want to access support during that time too, because some parents have said it was. It was really hard. I stopped going to support groups because I was reunified and everybody was so happy for me, but it still wasn't going great. Um, but I didn't feel I could talk about it because nobody else had reunification. So, you know, I think it, it can be wonderful, but in some cases it can still be a little tricky. So there's um, wonderful support groups at, 
of course, through Family Access, which I'm sure everybody knows their wonderful website um, that Elaine Cobb has set up so beautifully over the years, and then Alienated Grandparents. Um, both of these have wonderful uh, and helpful ideas for coping for grandparents. And then there's also legislation for grandparents' rights that's at various stages and in states of, of making little bits and pieces of progress that can give grandparents some standing to um, have some time with their grandchildren. I'm not an expert on that, but I do try to follow it because it's so important. Um, and court mediation in divorce is really important. Um, and Edward Kruk in Canada talks a lot about this. He says, if you can mediate, um, if, if you can mediate grandparenting time in, medi in mediation, it's, it's so important and it's so helpful. Um, it's so much more helpful than trying to do it after divorce. And remember the most important thing is self-care, developing emotional resilience, uh, support groups, can be very helpful. Um, over three quarters of study participants found attending a support group somewhat very or extremely helpful. It uh, helped improve relationship and coping skills and decreased isolation because you're with people with a common problem and you can gain support and uh, recognition for your situation. And maybe even learn something that can bring about a shift in the situation. And so um, John Killinger's um, lovely wife, Ann Killinger, who wrote a, uh, a book called A Son is a Son Until He Gets a Wife, How Toxic Daughters-in-Law Destroy Families. And Ann uh, found that attending support groups was profoundly helpful because she didn't know anybody in this situation really when this first happened to her when she was cut off. So uh, she talks a lot about the importance of support groups. If you feel the need to seek counseling, make sure you find a counselor that knows about these dynamics of alienation and cut off. And then breathe, focus, and tell yourself you did the best you could at the time with what you had, no parents perfect. Um, and that their memory of you is incorrect. Some people have found help with 12 step programs. Whatever works for you or finding pieces of the puzzle of self care that works for you. Uh, divorce professionals have a call to learn about uh, the importance of grandparents and grandchild's life and, and uh, move uh, Edward Krupp from Canada. Again, I, I talk about him because he's, he's very important in the Canadian uh, court system and he advocates a lot for um, shared parenting. But he said, uh, we, that what we need is an intergenerational model of divorce practice, not just a nuclear family model. Interventions extended need to be extended from the nuclear to the extended family because grandparents are so important. As we recognize the salience of grandparents in their grandchildren's lives, both before and after divorce, the necessity of actively advocating on behalf of the grandparent population. Uh, at the point of family divorce, particularly those who are most at risk of alienation is critical. And um, do, uh, Dr. Edward Krug has a wonderful website with a lot of information and articles about, uh, about this intergenerational model. And also he calls it paternal alienation, fathers and their families in particular being, uh, being cut off. So my, this is my last slide. Um, and I just wanted to mention a quote by Arthur Kornhaber. Uh, who, who was one of the originators of the Grandfather, Grandparent Research Project, the longest ongoing parenting research and information project. He's written, I think about seven books and numerous articles. He says, society needs to create a culture that facilitates the application of such grandparent power, love, wisdom, perspective, and selflessness 
to the benefit of family and society. So I think that's really a lovely quote. So I'd like to thank you all so much for attending and, um, and I'm looking forward to hearing if you have any, any thoughts or questions now.